joining us now is Justin Garcia. We're, we're going to introduce him in just a second, but we'll talk. We'll be talking about a range of issues about local police departments, including how a shocking police raid in 2014 led to a review of the city of Tampa's SWAT procedures and a settlement for the family of a man who was killed by police. So I want to welcome now our guest, Justin Garcia, who is the Tampa Bay Times state and local accountability reporter. Welcome back to Tuesday Cafe, Justin. Thank you, Sean. Thanks for having me. I'm really glad you could join us. So um, later on in the interview, I'm going to ask about some of your reporting on things like local police departments monitoring private security cameras and a local man that's asking the feds to return his electronic devices after his home was raided in a probe that's related to Fox News. But let's start with a story that's about nine years in the making. And some of our listeners will remember this. So before we get caught up to today with the changes that the police department might be implementing, why don't you bring us back to May 27th, 2014, when Jason Westcott was killed in a Tampa police raid at his home near what was then called the Lowry Park Zoo. Yeah, so um, that night, uh, TPD showed up with a SWAT team, uh, tactical response vehicle, a police in, in armor, uh, and essentially broke into Westcott's home where he lived with his boyfriend at the time. Um, they broke in, and within a matter of, of seconds, Westcott was dead, and um, and leading up to that, they had been, TBD had been investigating Westcott for being an alleged drug dealer. Um, but that was a very murky situation because the informant they were using came forward and said that not only did he lie, uh, but he was coerced to lie about Westcott selling drugs or selling large amounts of drugs, right? Um, inside of Westcott's house after. TBD shot and killed him, they found 0.2 grams of marijuana. Um, and so leading up to this, this informant had been telling them, oh yeah, he's selling me weed, when in reality they had just been friends and neighbors and Westcott shared weed with them. And this informant would say, hey man, I'm, I'm having a hard time. Can you hook me up and sell me a little bit? You know, and then when Westcott didn't have anything to sell this informant, uh, the informant alleged that the police coerced him into saying, oh, no, he did sell you um, weed today. He sold you a gram and had him kind of go along with their narrative. So unfortunately, this led to this situation that night uh, back in 2014, where police broke in and um, shot and killed Westcott. Our guest is Justin Gar Garcia, who is the Tampa Bay Times state and local accountability reporter. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're hearing about several issues about local police departments, including how this shocking police raid in 2014 led to a, re a review of the city of Tampa's SWAT procedures and a settlement for the family of the man who was killed by the police. And we're broadcasting live from the studios of WMNF in Tampa on August 15th. And I'd like to hear what you think about it as well. You can email us at dj at wmnf.org. You can text 813-433-0885. Or if you'd like, you can phone in 813-239-9663. And this story may sound familiar to readers of The Times, of course, or to listeners of WMNF because... Uh, we're going to play some audio right now that comes from a WMNF show that aired in April of 2015. We're going to play a couple minutes right now of Jason Westcott's mother. Remember, Jason is the person that, that Justin was telling you about who was shot and killed in this raid. His mother's name is Patty Silliman. And we'll also hear from Jason's boyfriend, Israel or Izzy Reyes. They were interviewed on WMNF by Rob Lorai in April of 2015 about what happened when Jason Westcott was killed. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. We'll be back in a second with Justin Garcia, but here is some of the mother and boyfriend of the man who was killed. He was a um, motorcycle mechanic. Uh, he also worked with his brother doing um, cell phone towers. Jason was... <laughs> He just, he had a huge heart and he was there for everybody. You won't find a soul that didn't know him that he didn't do something for in a positive way. Mm -hmm. And and is you're his boyfriend. Uh, give us a little bit more about Jason and who he was. Like Patty was saying, he was, he had a huge heart. He always did something for anybody. It 
if, even if it didn't benefit him, he was he was always willing to do it. And uh, uh, the two of you lived, you rented a house off North Boulevard in Seminole Heights, not too far from the Lowry Park Zoo, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. How long were you together with uh, Jason? Uh, for two and a half years. Uh -huh. Let's talk about uh, the night of the raid, if we could, for a moment. Uh, what do you remember about the night of the raid? Um, well, we were both working that day, so I came home. Jason was already home from work. I came inside the house and, um, you know, took a shower, got ready, and we ate dinner early that day around 5 or 6 o'clock, and he passed out in the bedroom sleep, and I went out to the living room to watch some TV, and I ended up passing out asleep, and then the next thing I know, I'm being drugged off the couch and thrown onto the ground by the SWAT team, and then... I hear the gunshots when they shot and killed them. How many gunshots did you hear? There were five gunshots consecutively. Did Jason die right away? He did. Yeah. And did you see Jason? Um, I seen him after the fact, after they shot him, after the two officers were standing over him. It must have been really hard on you. Yeah, it was really hard seeing the blood spatter dripping down the walls and it was it just wasn't a it wasn't a sight for anybody to see the tampa police department raided your home because they thought that you and jason were dealing drugs were you guys drug dealers no we we're not drug dealers we we're recreational pot smokers you know we we did have marijuana and we would smoke with our friends and that was it that was it. That was it. Uh, Patty, how did you get the word that, that Jason had been killed? I was at work and my um, my other son called my my work and told me that there had been a raid at my son's house and that I needed to leave work. And I said, a raid? What do you mean? You have to know that previously, seven months before, there was a... Um, an incident at his house where people had threatened to rob him. So I assume that's what he meant. And then my son said, no, my, you have to leave like right now because Jason was shot. And I'm like, shot by who? And he said the police. And that was pretty much how I found out I was at work by my son. Had, had Jason ever been in trouble with the police prior to this? Never. Matter never. of fact, he called them looking to make sure that he was safe. Well, that was Patty Silliman, the mother of Jason Westcott. And we also heard Westcott's boyfriend, Izzy Reyes, speaking with WMNF's Rob Lorai in April of 2015. And we're going to hear a little bit more from Izzy Reyes in a few minutes. But I want to bring back our guest, Justin Garcia, who is the Tampa Bay Times state and local accountability reporter. And Justin, your reporting recently uh, has been that there's been a settlement in this case and also that there have been policy changes to how the SWAT team is used. So let's start with that settlement. What did Jason's family uh, get in a settlement? Yeah, so the city of Tampa paid uh, Silliman $75,000. Um, the state of Florida caps its uh, wrongful death uh, settlements in situations like this at 250000 and um, Silliman thought it was best after such a long legal battle to just move on and, and accept what the city was offering. But um, since 2014, she has said over and over again, you can even look at previous news articles from, from years ago where she says it's not about the money so much as changing the culture changing uh, what, what the SWAT team does and how it's implemented in order to make sure that this doesn't happen to anybody else's child. And so in that way, she got what she wanted, you know, um, and that that's kind of what was revealed in this reporting as well. Uh, the SWAT team kind of quietly months after the shooting changed the way that it operates. And they did that through, um, uh, a points-based matrix that I looked at where they essentially say, hey, you got to check off all these all these check boxes first before you actually have the SWAT team move in, you know, and break into somebody's house with guns drawn. 
So did the police eventually clear Jason Westcott of any of wrongdoing in this case? I mean, uh, even in their statement for this story, they kind of justify the shooting, uh, even though they've settled with, with uh, Miss Silliman. You know, they say that because Westcott had a gun in his house, um, that the shooting was was justified, you know. Um, but that's a very complicated situation as well because TPD knew that Westcott had a gun. They knew that it was legally purchased. And they knew that because Westcott had called officers leading up to the raid months before when he saw that people were um, chatting about possibly robbing his house uh, online. And um, he got like a screenshot of that, I believe, and then said, hey, you know, reached out to TBD, said, hey, I'm feeling like I might be in danger here and I might get robbed. And TPD detectives advised him, if anybody breaks into your house, you should shoot to kill. Um, that being said, Westcott never shot, and there's no evidence that he even raised his gun uh, at the officers who shot him. Um, but that 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 should have been in TPD's mind, uh, Silliman believes, before breaking into the house, you know, and before using that kind of aggressive tactic that they used that night uh, that Westcott died. Our guest is Justin Garcia, who is the Tampa Bay Times state and local accountability reporter. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're hearing about local police departments. The, right now, we're speaking about that police raid in 2014 that led to a review of the Tampa city of Tampa's SWAT procedures and also a settlement for the family of the man who was killed. And we're broadcasting from WMNF in Tampa. Um, in your piece, you mentioned that the Tampa police SWAT team arrived at, at a house at the house where Reyes and Westcott lived. And you wrote that they had a Bearcat armored vehicle, a tactical response trailer and officers wearing body armor. And that minutes later, Westcott was dead and his body riddled with shotgun and pistol bullets. So I want to play this. This last clip that we have here is Izzy Reyes. That's Westcott's boyfriend. His description of what he saw last night. And then we'll be back back with Justin Garcia after we hear from Izzy. The whole street was filled with cops. Um but initially it was the tactical response team who was in the house and there was like at least five or six of them. I, I can remember four or five rushing in all at the same time. And then after the fact, they brought me out the house and I sat in a um, cop car for like four hours. So I seen, um, you know, Jason being brought out of the house and, them doing, you know, their job. How were the police dressed? The, the SWAT team who came into my house, they're dressed in all black. So you couldn't really tell that it was the police because I couldn't see any, like, they didn't have anything that stated that they were the police on them. It was just an all black suit. And then just the regular officers were in, in their uniform and then they had undercover officers out there as well that just looked like regular people did it look like a military operation to you it didn't it was i just couldn't believe how many patrol vehicles were out there and over something we over nothing that was izzy reyes speaking on wmnf with Rob Lorai in 2015, describing the night the previous year that the police raided his house and killed his boyfriend, Jason Westcott. And we're speaking live now on WMNF on April 15th, 2023, with the Times, Tampa Bay Times state and local accountability reporter, Justin Garcia. So police in that case had a warrant to break into Westcott's house. Uh, I think those are called no-knock warrants, but you can uh, correct me if I've got it wrong there. And as you said earlier, this was based on the false information they had gotten from an unreliable informant, Ronnie Kugel. Um, and you also mentioned, and maybe you can go into a little bit more detail here, that not only was he unreliable, but Kugel was also coerced by the Tampa police officers to kind of make up this claim about buying drugs from Westcott. Yeah, yeah. Um... Back in 2014, I believe, there, there was an article uh, that was kind of a deep dive into this 
uh, informant that talks about, you know, his history, how how several times he had been unreliable and was known to lie, but yet TPD kept using him anyways. Um, and beyond that, from what it, what it seems like from the, the informant's perspective, is that he was kind of afraid to not lie right like he they they paid him too this is another thing is he was making money off of this so if he doesn't give them cases if he doesn't give them quote unquote drug dealers right then he doesn't have that position anymore and uh in his mind i think in the story he talks about being in fear of losing this job because what else is he going to do at this point right he had already been to prison and stuff like that and it's hard to find a job so he had that personal incentive like hey you want to keep getting paid by us to be an informant you better produce the goods kind of thing and then uh he alleged in in this previous time story as well that he tried to tell them you know hey he doesn't have anything in there you know uh, and they said oh no you bought a gram from him is what is what this informant alleged and also saying that you know the but the police kind of coerced him into saying that that he saw like a pound of marijuana in there, you know, that that he had first said that he saw some marijuana and then they're like, how much? And kind of talked him into saying that there was this large amount that could justify, you know, getting this warrant and and breaking into the home. Um, and, and that was part of the SWAT changes that I found with my recent story too this year is that in this email that I obtained uh, as part of writing this story, the SWAT team commander says, hey, you need to check on your informants before you before you move with information from them. So it did lead to these changes that the, that the police kind of kept quiet for eight years until this story came out. Um, and uh, Kugel, the informant um, for TBD after the uh, after the Westcott raid was then redlined, which is a term for they're no longer using that informant anymore. So after this raid, you know, even though TPD isn't saying outright, oh, we made these mistakes and we changed things, the the proof is in the pudding kind of, right? Like there are there are documents and changes that were made that kind of show um, that they realized what was wrong with this situation and decided to change things. In this case, police used, got a warrant that allowed them to break into the house without any kind of warning, without any, without knocking or anything. But are there other mes- methods they could have used to catch what they thought was a drug dealer um, that didn't involve uh, such a potentially violent scene? Yeah, that's kind of what Silliman's lawyer talked to me about, John McGuire. Um, there there are several methods, and he's, he's a former law enforcement officer too, so he talked about, you know, you turn off the water outside so that way they can't flush a large amount of drugs and then you can kind of turn on your lights uh really bright and use a bullhorn and shout you know um tpd tampa police you know come outside and get them to to come outside so that way the officers are safer too that was another uh big contention that the, that john mcguire had with this um situation being a former law enforcement officer and i i read the depositions by the cops who were involved in the raid. And uh, as McGuire points out, you're not only, you know, you not only put Westcott and his boyfriend's lives in danger and took Westcott's life. You also are putting this police in an unnecessarily dangerous situation, right? Like um, who knows what could have happened. Um, And like, like I said, Westcott had been told by TPD detectives before shoot to kill if somebody comes in here because you're being, you're being threatened and people are, are threatening to rob you. You know, so it was a, it was a highly dangerous situation that could have been avoided by these other tactics is what the legal team argued. Right. So they could have done what I talked about, turn off the water, stood outside, asked them to come outside. And, you know, the fact that they found 0.2 grams of weed after the shooting kind of says like, hmm, you know, it makes you wonder would would Westcott and his boyfriend just have come outside if, if they had asked them to. Our guest is Justin Garcia. He is the Tampa Bay Times State and local accountability reporter. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. And we've been hearing about a range of issues of local police departments, including this story about that police raid in 2014 that Justin found has led to a review of the city of Tampa's SWAT procedures and a settlement for the family of the man who was killed. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And I want to turn now to another story that you recently published. 
And it's about how 13 law enforcement agencies in Florida, including two here in the Tampa Bay area, the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office and the Clearwater Police Department, do business with a company called Fusis. And correct me if I've got that pronunciation incorrect. And this company will allow those law enforcement agencies to watch video from up to 2,500 private security cameras, such as those ring doorbell security cameras in real time if the users opt in. So what does this Fusis technology do, Jason, Justin? Yeah, so uh, essentially law enforcement stance on the Fusis technology is that it keeps communities safer by increasing police oversight in areas where there normally wouldn't necessarily be police oversight. Um, but that's complicated, right? Because without FUSIS, uh, police can go and obtain video footage, right? So say a shooting happens in your neighborhood and you have a ring doorbell camera and the police are trying to figure out what's going on. Without the FUSIS technology, they can come and knock on your door and say, hey, do you want to turn over this footage? If you want to, to help them figure out what's going on, then you can turn over turn over your footage, right? Um However, with FUSIS, it's different because what happens is once the police get an agreement from a private home or a private business, they can then have real-time access to those cameras at kind of any time. So that means if you as, an, as, a, as a citizen are walking into this business and that business has agreed to allow real-time monitoring of their cameras by the police, you can walk into that business and uh, you can be unaware that you're now under surveillance by the police, right? Same thing with their outdoor cameras of those businesses or even walking through your neighborhood, correct? Like if if they've made a deal with several people in your neighborhood, which I've heard since this story, they've sent out multiple emails to people that have responded uh, to this story saying, hey, join this program. So that could turn into, and this is what the privacy advocates argue, that can turn into a Kind of a vast police spying network where these fuses uh, infused cameras are now kind of monitoring kind of any, every corner of neighborhoods um and and so that's where the kind of conflict between law enforcement saying it keeps us safer and privacy and civil right a advocates comes in where it's it's like how much of our personal privacy do we want to give away for this potential for for more safety um in our neighborhoods. And you mentioned when the, if, if there is a crime and police would like access to these private cameras, you mentioned they can go to a, a house, for example, and ask for permission, but they also, even if they're denied that, they could get a warrant and get this by, you know, the courts could, they could convince the courts that this is important enough that they have to access it regardless of whether the homeowner wants them to or not. So it's not like there's no other way for them to get this information. Yeah. And that's traditionally been the method, right? Um, and that, that, that's also kind of important for a lot of people because it leaves a paper trail, right? You got a warrant, you got a piece of paper, you went and talked to these people and you, you obtained this footage with FUSIS. Another issue is that once they have access, there's, it's really hard to track how often they're tapping in and, and watching that video feed um, and, and what they're obtaining from that video feed, what they're keeping. Uh, and that's another contention that civil rights advocates have is, you know, this, this, this technology has kind of, um, it's kind of blasted off in the past few years, right? Like it just started spreading uh, in 2019, 2020. And within the past few years, it's it's kind of everywhere uh, across the country. And Florida is actually one of the leading states in the country, um, from from what I've found, in implementing this technology. So that that can be an issue because it's spreading so quickly, right? Like a lot of technology that spreads really quickly and is new. But how do we hold on to the oversight and accountability of how it's being used and how it's being implemented? Um, in, in in this story, in this case, I found two local agencies that are using it, and Clearwater Police Department was pretty transparent and shared documentation with me and sat down for an interview with me and answered some hard questions, whereas Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office, they were very guarded. I kind of had to push and push to get them to even admit that they had a current contract that they could share with me that shared more 
details about how they're using Fuses and how many cameras they have access to, which they can, in Hillsborough County, they can gain up access of up to a thousand private cameras. Um, and so that raises red flags for me as a reporter, right? And I think for civil rights advocates too, is um, why be guarded about this if it's such a positive technology that's being used to, to help the community? Why not be transparent? And I think that's the key with technologies like this. And this is kind of the argument being made is if these technologies are gonna be used correctly and to benefit the community, then there has to be transparency. Our guest is Justin Garcia, the Tampa Bay Times state and local accountability reporter. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're talking about police departments in the area. Right now we're talking about video technology that they're getting access to. And the this Fusis company that that uh, these two company these two agencies that is are, are working with, they also have add-ons to their basic model. And maybe you can tell us what these add-ons are and what they might be able to do. So one is a predictive policing tool. Another is AI, artificial intelligence searches, and then gunshot detection. So what would those add-ons do to this technology and to privacy? Yeah, so Fusis, the way it works. Um... One officer described it as essentially like buying a car that you can get the full blown model with all of the add-ons, or you can get the more stripped down version that just gives you access to cameras. Um, but some of these add-ons are do have a, a kind of disturbing history, right? Um, for example, there there's now this company called Geolitica, and they changed their name from Predpol, um, which that name Predpol came under fire years ago in 2021 because essentially what that is is predictive policing, right? And it's a technology that that tells police, hey, these communities are more likely to have crimes, so you need to patrol them more. The problem with that is, and this is a, a historical problem with this type of policing, is that uh, there was an analysis of Predpol and the predictions it was making and where it was telling police to go and the increased police presence was um, was over and over again found to be in neighborhoods that are are black, Latino, low income, and stuff like that. So that has raised a lot of red flags. Uh, just those partnerships with with companies like that, and then they also um, partner with Sound Thinking, which is the parent company for Shot Spotter, Shot Spotter, and that's a gunshot detection tool. I actually found um, last year, I believe that. Shot spotters being used by Tampa Police Department, but only in East Tampa, right, which is the historically black and brown uh, neighborhood of Tampa. So, anyways, Fusis teams up with Shot Spotter as well, and uh, the the cameras can kind of be linked to the Shot Spotter interface, where it's like, hey, there was a a sound that sounds like a gunshot uh, in this neighborhood, and so then the cameras in that area are kind of like alerted in the in the monitoring system by the police, and then they can go and access those cameras to look for that gunshot sound. The problem with that is Shot Spotter has over and over again been found to be faulty, right? It's been found to waste police time. It's been found to negatively affect that they interact with the communities. Uh, it's put an innocent uh, black Chicago man in jail. Um, based on faulty shot spotter evidence, because sometimes shot spotters alerted by loud exhausts and stuff like that too, right? Or fireworks. Uh, and so it can lead to all these problems. And this isn't just civil rights groups that have found these problems with shot spotter. It was the Chicago Attorney General um, who reviewed shot spotter and found how, how negative this can, this can be in certain situations and when used the wrong way. And uh, in Clearwater, they said that they're not using Geolitica Predpol or Shot Spotter, um, and uh, a spokesperson for HCSO said that they don't use the Shot Spotter technology add-on, but didn't answer if they use um, the Geolitica or predictive policing tool with with Fusis. Another item that the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office uses in conjunction with Fusis is something else that's called Eye on Crime Network, and instead, in, in, in contrast, I guess with these private security cameras that people might have at their homes or private businesses, this Ion Crime Network links to hundreds of publicly owned cameras at intersections. So how does this combination uh, play out in, in uh, law enforcement? Yeah, so that is the thing about Fusis too, is it's not just private cameras, right? Um, people already know for the most part that 
law enforcement can access public cameras at intersections and and HTSO has been doing that for a while, but now FUSIS can kind of link the publicly owned cameras that law enforcement can monitor and the private. So it just creates this huge network, right? Around say in Hillsborough County, around the county where at intersections, and then when you walk into a business, and then when you walk through a neighborhood, there's kind of constant surveillance, right? And we've 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 heard about that for a long time about what can be the problems with that. You know, science fiction authors were writing about it in the 1950s. And you know, even the Clearwater po uh, Police Department chief said, we're not trying to be big brother here, you know. Um, so people are aware of these the privacy intrusions that can occur. Um uh, and so that's what's raised a lot of concern around around the FUSIS technology is now it's grabbing these public cameras, uh, teaming it up with potential other technology that's had uh, a spotty history, right? And then uh, also the private cameras. So eventually, depending on how fast this spreads, it could be one of those situations where it could lead to some um, intrusion of privacy. The Hillsborough Sheriff's Office also uses trailers that recognize license plates. Yeah, yeah. And what's interesting is I had seen those around, I was like taking pictures of those last year or something and uh, sending them around and trying to figure out what those were. And then through grabbing this contract with Fusis, I was like, oh, that's what they were. Because I've seen them around downtown Tampa, other parts of the county. Uh, and so, yes, there are these uh, license plate recognition trailers, which essentially uh, automatically scan license plates. Uh, that that drive by these trailers of little they're like square boxes usually uh like, like usually metal outside and then they have a camera coming off the top and that camera is just scanning license plates automatically um the details of that are kind of spotty are are they just looking for people with outstanding warrants maybe or are they alerting police to expired tags i i don't know for sure yet but um they, they requested funding for that to the tune of almost $200,000 um, back in 2020, at least. Well, Justin Garcia is the Tampa Bay Times state and local accountability reporter. And we were talking at the beginning of this segment about FUSIS, which is a company that allows the law enforcement agencies that have it, like Hillsborough County Sheriff's and Clearwater Police Department, to access individual home and businesses, private security cameras, if the user opts in. And I want to focus on that last statement here for a second. So how can people check to see if maybe they opted in and didn't mean to, or maybe they have, is there a way to opt back out if they have changed their mind? That's a great question. Um, so after this story, I received some input and I, I want to get a copy of this email, but apparently HCSO has been sending around an email that kind of says, join this program. It'll be part of your community like activity or community monitoring network. Um, and then they said that it was kind of in the fine print of the email that it was like saying that the police would have constant access to this, to this network. Right. So I, I don't know if that's confirmed yet. Obviously I still have to get a copy of that email. That's a great question with this technology is, is, is I know for sure with businesses, they go, they send emails and they approach in person and they say, hey, do you want to join this network to keep your business safer? And I think it's pretty explicit. I think with the the way they're selling the, the home uh, monitoring technology, it's perhaps a little more gray, right? Um, it's a little more like just join this network. It'll, it, it'll be good for your neighborhood kind of thing. Uh, which is the, the the law enforcement stance is that it'll be good for your neighborhood. But I want to make sure, you know, in, in a potential follow up that that law enforcement is being very explicit in saying you are joining this program that will give us real time access to your cameras by agreeing to this. You're opting in. And I believe people can opt back out. Um, but that's a good question to confirm. And throughout this discussion, you've been talking about privacy concerns that advocates have mentioned about police using this technology. And one more that I'd like to, to say is that in your article, it mentioned that one of the, the uh, privacy advocates said that whenever there's over-policing, and using that term, I guess, to describe having access to hundreds and hundreds of, of private cameras, over-policing often results when the community is under a microscope. 
Yeah, exactly. And and that is that is the history of, of some of this technology, including the shot spotter example I gave, right? You put shot spotter in the neighborhood, it starts hearing sounds that sound like gunshots, and all of a sudden more police are kind of swarming. And then what kind of neighborhood is that that they put the shot spotter technology in? Oh, it's a black and brown neighborhood. It's a low income neighborhood. And so yeah, that can lead to a lot more kind of arrests, a lot more kind of shakedowns and and kind of um giving the police uh, like kind of a probable cause to be in that neighborhood and talk to people and then, you know, see what happens from there. Uh, and, and then, yeah, anytime you have kind of like more increased police presence in one neighborhood with this negative connotation, right? Like, Oh, there are more shootings here. It's more dangerous. It's more, it's more, you know, it's, it's, it's unsafe. So we have to be here to take out the bad element, which, you know, nobody wants to be in a neighborhood with a lot of shootings. Nobody wants to be, in a neighborhood that feels unsafe, but it's even been found, like I said, by the Chicago attorney general, that that kind of mindset going into those neighborhoods can lead to some really bad situations where, where the wrong decision is made and where innocent people are harmed. Well, let's turn now to a third recent article of yours that I'd like to discuss in the last four or five minutes that we have. This involves the latest developments in the case of a Tampa man whose home was searched by the FBI the feds have now denied Tim Burke's request that his electronics equipment be returned while the government investigates leaked Fox News videos. So remind us what happened there. Yeah, so it was back in May. Um, I received a tip. I, I got a phone call that uh, Tim Burke, who is a journalist who's worked for uh, Deadspin, um, you know, Gawker, all kinds of, of big national outlets, uh, and now owns a media consulting business and uh, does journalism on the side. Uh, his house was had was surrounded by law enforcement um, on this day, May I believe it was May eighth. And so I ran over there, uh, talked to the agents. They didn't identify what law enforcement agency they were with. I confirmed that it was the FBI, and then kind of broke that story. And then everybody's going, "Well, what the hell was, was this about?" Right? And then we obtained a document that showed that. Um, it was related to these leaked videos of behind the scene footage of Tucker Carlson that was later published by the website Media Matters and this anti-Semitic rant from Kanye West, um, which was later published by, I believe, Vice, and that uh, Burke had obtained those videos. And that's what the FBI was concentrating on uh, specifically, uh, was was obtaining those videos and perhaps others related to this big Fox News leaks that had occurred over the course of months. And uh, Burke's legal team, which includes um, Mark Rash, who's a former federal prosecutor for computer crimes, argues that Burke was doing journal digital journalism, right? He was finding videos that maybe Fox News didn't want him to find, but he was finding them in a publicly accessible forum and then uh, helping distribute them to these media outlets that later published them. Uh, and meanwhile, the prosecutor for the U.S. Department of Justice is saying that they need more time to, to find, to look through uh, Burke's devices. Keep in mind now it's been over three months, right? Uh, and ob obtaining all those devices or confiscating all those devices also stopped Burke's work completely, right? And his 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 company, Burke's Communica Burke Communications, worked for ESPN. His work was on H HBO, major, major media outlets, right? And so this all came to a standstill when his, um, when his devices were confiscated. So to this day, Burke still hasn't been charged with any type of crime. And they're arguing, hey, give me my equipment back because I need to be able to do my work. Uh, and meanwhile, the prosecutor for the U.S. Department of Justice has said, said that there may be possible, quote, uh, fruits of a crime in those devices and that they need more time. Um, just recently, Burke was given access not to his phone, but to his phone's authentic authentication system. So that way he could access, you know, um, uh, his Twitter accounts and bank accounts and stuff like that. So he's able to do that part of his life again and get back online. Um, but they're still holding on to his devices while they investigate. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming back on Tuesday Cafe, Justin. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate well, it. 
I'm really glad you could join us. Uh, very informative. Thanks so much. Well, Justin Garcia is the Tampa Bay Times state and local accountability reporter. I also want to thank our earlier guest, Sean Claffey, the director and a producer of the new documentary, Americon. And if you missed any of these interviews, you can watch them on our website, WMNF.org, beginning this afternoon. I want to thank our phone screener, John Dunn. You've been listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. During this time slot tomorrow, Shelly Reback will host Midpoint. Her guests will be attorney Michelle Lambeau and the Tampa Five. They're USF students who are facing felonies for protesting Governor DeSantis's efforts to ban diversity, equity, and inclusion on campus. Next up is Wavemakers with Janet and Tom Sherberger. Their guest will be Eric Deggins, NPR's TV critic and member and author of the book Race Bader. This is WMNF Tampa. <laughs>